How do you reunite two countries that have been divided by ideology for 40 years? This was the question facing Germany when the Berlin Wall fell. The Soviet Union couldn't keep the two halves of Germany apart forever. What happened when the two sides joined forces again after being apart for so long? On this episode of Intrigued Mind, we'll be looking at the reunification of West and East Germany. 32 years ago, Germany was split up into two separate countries. These countries had totally different ideologies and did not get along. Today, the two halves of Germany are united and make up the largest economy in Europe. How exactly did this happen? The downfall of East Germany, known as the German Democratic Republic, was fast and unexpected. The majority of people in the West didn't expect it to fall apart when it did, despite the fact that it was the biggest and most studied political issue of the time. Its collapse was brought about by the decay of its communist neighbors in Eastern Europe. The leader of East Germany, Erich Honecker, was a true communist who was shocked by the Soviet Union's liberal reforms under Gorbachev. He had been a communist since before World War II and had been imprisoned by the Nazis for his participation in political activities in Germany. He managed to survive the entire duration of the Third Reich, and when World War II ended, the Soviets freed him and put him in charge. He went from a jail cell to the highest office in the newly created country of East Germany. He disliked what the Soviets were doing under Gorbachev so much that he actually banned certain Soviet publications that he thought were subversive. He thought the Russians were getting too soft, but it was too late. Communism was already collapsing around him, and there was really nothing he could do to stop the tide of history. The Berlin Wall was essentially breached in the summer of 1989, when the Hungarian government started to allow East Germans to escape to the West through Hungary's newly opened border with Austria. Citizens could sense that communism was falling to pieces, and they took advantage of the opportunity to escape. By the fall of 89, thousands of East Germans had taken this route. Thousands more had gone to the West German embassies in Prague and Warsaw and asked to be allowed to immigrate to West Germany. Refugees were pouring in, and the crumbling Soviet regime wasn't in a position to stop them from leaving. There were mass protests in the streets of Leipzig and other East German cities full of people defying the government and demanding real reform. In an attempt to try and put a stop to all this, the Politburo got rid of Haunecker and replaced him with Egon Krenz, another devoted communist. Krenz and the Soviets tried to halt this embarrassing situation and prevent refugees from escaping to the West via Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. In typical Soviet fashion, however, their attempts at controlling people only made things even worse. On November 9th, a communist functionary named Gunter Schabowski accidentally announced on the news that the government would now allow East Germans to move to West Germany. This was not actually the case. What he was supposed to announce was that the government would require East Germans to apply for exit visas during normal working hours. The announcement, however, was widely interpreted to mean that East Germany had decided to open up the Berlin Wall that very evening. Crowds gathered at the wall and demanded to be let into West Berlin. The border guards, totally unprepared for the scenario, just let them through. The night turned into one big party, and tens of thousands of East Germans poured through the crossing points of the wall and celebrated with West Berliners. The opening of the Berlin Wall was the end of the German Democratic Republic. It led to bigger and bigger public demonstrations by the citizens against the government. They demanded democracy, real democracy. Krenz was replaced by a reform communist, Hans Madrau, who promised free, multi-party elections. Unsurprisingly, in these new free elections, the Communist Party lost in a landslide vote. Force had been the only thing keeping them in power. A new East German government, led by a broad coalition, began negotiations with the West for a treaty of unification. The refugee situation was still ongoing, and it was becoming unmanageable, so they were in urgent need of fast negotiations. In order to try and stem the tide of East Germans who were moving over, they quickly set up a monetary union before anything else had been established. This gave East Germans the hard currency of West Germany. The last major barrier to reunification fell in July 1990. Gorbachev had objected to the idea of a unified Germany joining the NATO alliance. However, he agreed to go along with it in exchange for West Germany giving the Soviets a lot of money. Russia was in desperate need of cash at the time. A unification treaty was ratified by the Bundestag and the People's Chamber in September and officially went into effect on October 3, 1990. The first all-German free election since the Nazis had taken over was held. After being split apart for 45 years, Germany was finally united. Some people at the time had assumed that it would never happen, or that if it did happen, it would be thanks to a lot of violence. A year later, the Treaty on the European Union was negotiated, which created the EU and eventually led to the Euro being implemented by the end of the decade. The reunification was a monumental achievement, but Germany quickly ran into a series of problems that put an end to the celebratory atmosphere. The European economy was having serious structural problems, and there were a lot of costs piling up due to the unification itself. In the 90s, Germany, like most European countries, had to deal with increased global competition, the increasing cost of running its elaborate welfare system, and persistent unemployment. 
they had picked a tricky time to reunite. The cost of unifying the East and the West were staggering. Not only that, they were totally unexpected. The West had completely failed to predict what this would require, as usually happens in the worlds of economics and politics. In fact, when someone actually can predict the cost of something accurately, it's the exception, not the rule. And usually, they just got lucky. The German taxpayer was surprised by how much they would have to pay up to deal with unification. The main issue was that the Eastern German economy was in terrible shape. It was far worse than anyone had realized because the communists kept things like this a secret as much as possible. There were only a handful of companies in East Germany that could actually compete on the world market without the government forcing people to do business with them. Most of them were extremely inefficient. On top of that, they were also disasters for the environment. As a result of these problems, what had formerly been the East German economy collapsed. Hundreds of thousands of East Germans became unemployed. East Germany became very dependent on federal money that was generated by the economy of West Germany. The infrastructure of East Germany was also in dire need of repair. The roads, rail lines, and telephone lines required massive amounts of money in order to be able to provide the basis for the future economy. The communists, it turned out, had not been great at maintaining the commune. The reunification process had been fast and pretty painless because everyone had thought that economic equality was right around the corner. But this turned out to be impossible. High unemployment and disappointment haunted East Germany for more than a decade after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The economic gap between the two halves of Germany was a big deal, but it was just one of several difficulties that went along with reunification. Many East Germans grew to hate what they saw as West Germany's attitude of arrogance and insensitivity. They felt like they were being looked down on by their neighbors. The terms Wessi for Westerner and Aussie for Easterner came to represent two different outlooks. Westerners were perceived as being competitive and aggressive. They were the product of what Germans called elbow society. Easterners were seen as passive and lazy, the product of the stifling and brutal communist regime. On top of the resentment, disillusionment, and economic problems, there were other legacies left by the 40 years of dictatorship in the East. East Germany, like Russia, had developed a powerful and far-reaching security apparatus that employed a huge network of professional and amateur informants. These people spied on their fellow citizens and reported any dissenters to the government. After unification, the files of the secret police became public information. East Germans suddenly discovered that many of their most famous citizens had been secretly working for the government. People learned that people they had been friends and neighbors with were on the secret police's payroll. Coming to terms with this both legally and personally added a lot of tension to the newly reunited country. Ultimately, however, the reunification of Germany has worked itself out and been a success. According to a 2019 Pew Research Center poll, about 90% of Germans believe that the reunification was good for Germany. Around 83% of East Germans approve of their transition into becoming a market economy. Life satisfaction in both parts of Germany has increased dramatically since 1991. Reunification was an unexpected and tricky process, but it's one with a happy ending. If you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creators of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.